بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله نحمد الله سبحانه وتعالى ونستغفره ونستعينه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله من يهده الله فهو فهو المهتد ومن يضل فلا هادي له الحمد لله Uh, first of all, uh, welcome to everybody that's uh, come online to join us and Ramadan Mubarak. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah give you a blessed uh, Ramadan. This is a very interesting Ramadan for all of us. Um, we, I think these are unprecedented circumstances we find ourselves in. Uh, I don't think ever in the history of uh, our species um, have the vast majority of people on the planet been uh, put into a type of house arrest, basically. So it's a, it's a very unusual situation, and because it's Ramadan, it's particularly difficult for a lot of Muslims because uh, we've been deprived of the masjid and also even just gatherings uh, and things like that in many places. So despite that fact, uh, there's always a silver lining uh, in, in the cloud, and we should see the blessing also of being uh, exempt from uh, public haunt, as Shakespeare says. Um, you know, there's a uh, the Duke Senor in in the uh, in the play As You Like It. He he's uh, his brother uh, takes over his kingdom and uh, he exiles him to the forest. Uh, but instead of seeing it as a, a a calamity, he actually sees the blessings in it, and and uh, that's where the famous line, "Sweet are the uses of adversity." You know, that even in adversity there are, there are benefits. Uses here means profits or benefits. So he says, sweet are the uses of adversity, uh, which like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. And this our life, exempt from public haunt, uh, finds tongues in trees, books in running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. So even though he's... Uh, exiled, he sees it actually that he's he's got an opportunity to get back to this Edenic life in nature. So we should see the blessings of uh, that are hidden within the tribulations. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala throughout the Quran tells us that He's going to try us, and uh, and in fact, it's one of the the reasons for our existence. Raghab um, al gives. Uh, these different reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us based on uh, a Quranic understanding. And one of them is ibtila, which in Arabic means test, trial, tribulation. Um, but it's, its fundamental meaning, bala, is a, is a trial or a tribulation. So we're tested. And this is obviously a test uh, for Muslims. So because it's Ramadan, uh, it's always a blessing if, you're, if you've been away from the Qur'an to come back to the Qur'an, if you've been with the Qur'an throughout the year to uh, intensify uh, your relationship with the Qur'an, but it is a time of coming back to the Qur'an. And the Prophet wasallam told us towards the latter days, he said, when things get difficult, um, he said, يُصْبِحُ الْحَلِيمُ حَيْرَانَ That even the sagacious one, the intelligent one, the, the forbearing one, somebody who is not, un, uh, is not unsettled easily, the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, he would become confused. So this part of the nature of that time. So uh, Sayyidina Ali, when he heard that, عنه, uh, he, he asked him, Mal khalasu yawma idhin? How do we get out of those circumstances? In other words, how do we get out of the confusion? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Kitabullah, the Book of Allah. And then it's a beautiful hadith, which is related in a few different narrations, but uh, Imam al-Tirmidhi and others related. But uh, he, he goes on just to talk about how everything is in the Qur'an. And so one of the things that a lot of people, because the Qur'an is not a linear book, in, 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 in the way that, for instance, if you open the Bible, it begins in Genesis. It literally begins in the beginning. And, and then, it, then you have a narrative. You have the Jewish uh, people uh, uh, as, a, as a central part of that narrative. Uh, but it's really, it begins with the story of humanity, with the first uh, mother and father of all of us, Adam and Hawa. Um, and then it, 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 uh, it gives you the five books of the Tanakh, which is uh, the, what, what we call the Torah. And then there's a, a linear 
uh, sequence. And then you have the New Testament according to the uh, Christian tradition. The Jewish tradition doesn't really like the idea of the New Testament because they don't see it as an Old Testament. There's no abrogation for them. And so, um, but with the Christians, they have the New Testament, which is, is also a narrative. If you look at it, in fact, some people have pointed out that it actually follows like a, a traditional Greek play uh, in, in, its, uh, in its sequence. Um, and then you have, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the latter part of it, you have uh, these uh, remarkable letters uh, that Paul writes to different peoples and Luke and, and others, the Acts of the Apostles. I mean, there's quite extraordinary uh, things in there. And, and it ends with Revelation, which is John of Patmos uh, has this revelation uh, in exile on this island in Greece and sees this kind of end of time scenario. So it begins in the beginning and ends with the book of Revelation, which is when everything unfolds at the end. So. The, the Quran, when, when, when the Quran was revealed, and we see it as Muslims, we see it as the last testament. It, it comes as a final testament from Allah, the last dispensation for humanity, and that in our understanding and our tradition, it abrogates the previous ones. It doesn't negate the truths that are in them, but it, it, it says that this is the final testament for, for humanity. Uh, and then it calls everybody to it, allowing them the option to stay outside of it. So uh, because it's a nonlinear book, for many people, especially Western people, when they go into it, they find it very confusing. Uh, and this is, we find this in um, Carlyle's, when he did Heroes and Hero Worship in Victorian England, he chose as a hero the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu which was scandalous at the time uh, because he didn't chose, uh, choose Jesus, for instance. But in there, he talks about how difficult it was for him to read the Quran. Um, and he said, if, if this is this remarkable book, where do we put the Iliad or the Odyssey? Um, in other words, uh, it's, it, it doesn't follow any patterns. Well, that's, I think, partly uh, a testimony to the truth of the Quran, that it is not like any other book, uh, because it is uniquely amongst the revealed books. It is the one that is directly from God. So even Jews and Christians understand that the Bible and the New Testament are inspired works. So they, they're, they're inspired by God. So there's a wahi, but, but it's human beings that it's transmitted through them. That's why they find discrepancies and other things in them that don't really bother them uh, from that perspective because they understand that the scribes can make mistakes and things like that. So they don't have the same understanding that we have, whereas the Quran itself comes directly from God to the Prophet and the Prophet is merely a conduit for this revelation. So it's coming through him to us. And, and so if we define the Quran according to the Usuli scholars, and, and there's two types of Usul in our tradition, there's Usul al-Din and Usul al-Fiqh. Usul al-Din uh, is, is related to aqidah or creed or what we believe. Uh, and and, and our, in our tradition, uh, the Quran, in the Sunni tradition, the Quran is madlul al-lavdi al-qa'imi bi dhatillah. So it's, it's the madlul, uh, in, in other words, it's the indications of this, uh, uh, that, 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 that the utterances convey that is eternal with Allah. So that, that is a very uh, difficult um, part of kalam or the tradition of dialectical theology that I'm not gonna go into. So that's one way to interpret it. But the way the fuqaha interpret it, and this is from Sidi Abdullah wal Hajj Ibrahim, one of the great Mauritanian Usuli scholars. He said, uh, he's, he's, he said that, the, that the Quran was lafzun munazzurun ala Muhammadi li ajl al i'jazi wal ta'abudi. So that's the definition in fiqh of the Quran. It is a, an utterance that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in order to incapacitate creation. In other words, to, as a miraculous book that could not be replicated and as a, as a, as a, uh, a means of devotion to abud. Now, uh, one of the interesting things about ta'abud is that the, the word in Arabic to recite the Quran, which is how we uh, uh, do devotion with the Quran, is tilawa. 
right? Right, the, those who recite the book, right? Tilawa is we recite the book, and then Hakka tilawa tihi, they do it with the with its due. And so, for the mujawid, the person who's doing tajweed, that means like to give i'ta'u kulli harfin mustahaqahu. Like they'll say to give every letter its due, and then its, its circumstantial due. So like idgham uh, is a circumstantial due. Not not every situation the wow. Uh, you have idgham in in the letters of idgham assimilation like yarmalun. So um, so for the mujawid that's what that means. But for the 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 uh, the, the faqih tilawa also means to follow. So it, it means to recite, but it also means to follow or to you know uh, to do what what the Quran is telling you to do. Wal qamri ida talaha. So why, the moon when it follows the sun. So tilawa means to recite and to follow. So when you yatruna kitab haq tilawati, when you're reciting the book of Allah as it should be recited, it means you're also following it. So it's not just simply following it, but it, uh, reciting it, but it's following. So you're reciting it with your tongue, you're believing it in your heart, and you're acting according to it with your arkan, right? So it's tilawatun ala lisan, i'tiqadun fil jinan, wal amnun bil arkan. So this is, this is how the book of Allah. Now, because it's a nonlinear book, and I'll just give you one example of something very fascinating about the Quran. Uh, the, the, the Jews have a lot of stories in their book. It's a very, in fact, the, the Bible is read as literature now. There are many people that will read the Bible as literature, not even believing that it's a revelation, but it's a fascinating book um, with great stories. The, uh, the, the Quran, when, when, when some of the Sahaba came and complained uh, about not having stories, like the Jews have stories, you know, uh, surat, the 12th surah in the Quran, Yusuf, is revealed. Yusuf is like a biblical story. It's, it's, it's a completely intact narrative in the Quran. It's the only chapter in the entire Quran that is, is similar. And it's as if, to me, it's as if God was saying, I can do that. Like, I can do a book like that. I've already done that. But this is different. Like this book is different. So the, 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 the extraordinary aspect of the Quran to me is that there is a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا أقسم بمواقع النجوم وإنه لقسم لو تعلمون عظيم إنه لقرآن كريم That I swear by the مواقع النجوم This is in Surah Al-Waqi'ah. I swear by the, the positions of the stars. And this is a vast oath, if you but knew. And this is a, a generous Quran. When, when I lived in the Sahara Desert, I used to go, every night would look up in the sky and it had the most clear skies in the world because there's no light pollution. And you could, the, the, the number of stars that you could see was just astronomical. Um, and, and it was so extraordinary to look up at the, at the night sky. But for, if, if you don't know anything about the stars, it just looks like a jumble of lights up in the heavens. And it, 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 it doesn't look like there's any order. They just look like. But there was a man there that I lived with who used to teach me the stars. So he'd show me at night. He'd say, this is, you know, Thuraya, and this is Al-Jabbar, and this is Al-Jathi. And, and he would show me, and then he would say, this one, uh, emerges on this date on the horizon, and this one on this date, and this one indicates this season. He had a complete knowledge of the night sky, and over time I got to understand the night sky in a completely different way, because most people grow up in environments where there's no uh, stars anymore. They might see a few stars, but they don't see stars anymore. The Quran is like that. If you look at it the way Thomas Carlyle looked at it, it's just a jumble of lights, astaghfirullah for even saying that, but that's what it appears to be to people. It appears as if it's just a jumble of these amazing you know, uh, lights that are flashing without any cohesion. But if you have the time, the patience, and the wherewithal to study the book, you will begin to see these incredibly deep patterns in the book. So it's very much the opposite of in the Western tradition where 
books have an outward cohesion, but as you begin to study them deeper, they often fall apart. This is what deconstruction is all about. And the Quran is the opposite. Outwardly, it looks like it's, it, it doesn't have a cohesion, but as the deeper you study it, the more uh, clear the order comes. And so what I wanted to do in this uh, short series of lectures is look uh, through the lens of one of the great Andalusian uh, exegetes, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, and I'm gonna talk also a little bit about Imam al-Ghazali's um, theory of al-Jawahir, because Imam al-Ghazali also has a very interesting theory of the Quran. To help people understand the, 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 the nature of the Qur'an, the deep structure of the Qur'an. But all, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Somebody recently told me that, you know, they found the repetition of the Qur'an um, uh, a little trying on them because they were reading the Qur'an. They found the repetition a little trying. And one of the things about the repetition in the Qur'an is that there is no repetition in the Qur'an. I mean, this idea that, um, that the... And I'll, and I'll get into that. I'm going to deal with that on one, one of these uh, sessions. The, the Quran, when, when it does use the, uh, the same stories, uh, very often you will see either it's embedded in a very different sequence for a purpose, and then you will see just changes in the words that are very subtle because of the sequence that, it, the sequence that it's in. And this is why traditionally our scholars understood that the miracle of the Quran is not a scientific miracle. There's some interesting scientific facts in the Quran, that's fine, but it is not the miracle of the Quran. The miracle of the Quran is rhetorical. It is, it is, it is a, a, a miracle of language. And we're in a civilization that privileges science over, and, I, and by that I mean the material sciences, over other aspects. But the single most interesting thing about our species is not science, it's language. We, we are uh, creatures of language, and this is what makes us unique. And the Quran is ultimately a linguistic miracle. It's a miracle of language. And language is what separates us from the rest of creation. All, all creation has certain types of languages and codes and everything, but we are the, uniquely this species that is endowed with the gift of uh, of, of, of the logos, of reason, and, and, and language by its very nature is reasonable, it is logical, and that's why it has a grammar, it has a, a deep structure, and that grammar can only be understood by studying it, and the same is true uh, for the Quran. So, uh, I just, uh, I'm gonna quickly go over the, um, the, so looking at these major themes from Ibn Juzay, and just a little bit about uh, Muhammad ibn Ahmad uh, bin Muhammad uh, uh, bin Juzay al-Kalbi. He, so he's from Bani Kalb, Yemeni tribe, al-Granati. So he's from, he was from Granada, and you can see there, uh, that's at the last stage of the Muslim presence in Spain when they were down to um, a very small kingdom in the south, um, before they were finally defeated by the Aragon and the Castilian alliance. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting because we, the year America was discovered is the year Andalusia falls. He, so he was born in Granada, which um, is an is a amazing uh, city that has the famous Alhambra Palace. But he also, uh, he died in the battle defending the Muslim land. So he's a shaheed. He's one of the great martyr shaheeds of our tradition. And, and he, he actually died as the Muslims were fleeing from the battlefield. <clears throat> he was seen calling them back uh, and to, to, to maintain their positions, and he ended up being killed. His books are some of my favorite books, and this, the book that we're going to be looking at, the introduction, is in the tafsir tradition. But one of my teachers, Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Shinqiti, uh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad al-Mukhtar al-Shinqiti, who was the son of the great Mufassir, who died recently, Allah yarhamuhu. And he did a beautiful tahqiq, uh, a critical edition of one of uh, Ibn Juzay's books on usul. He told me that the reason his books are so, <clears throat> I think, uh, loved by people who fall into his, um, his world is because he wrote them for his son. So all of his books were written for his son Muhammad, 
uh, he wanted to give him the zubda, like the cream of our tradition. And so all of his books are very short, but they're packed with an incredible amount of information. And the Tasheel, which is the book that we're going to be looking at, this is a manuscript of it. It's called a Tasheel li Ulum Tanzil, making easy or the facilitation of the sciences of revelation. So he intended it to make it to make the Quran accessible to people. And that's part of the beauty of this book because we're in an age where people need a more accessible uh, knowledge. I mean, during our periods of great civilizational flourishing, knowledge was, were very rarefied. Uh, if people know the English term gibberish, gibberish comes from Jabir bin Hayyan because he was so confusing when the Europeans translated him to Latin, most of them couldn't understand it, so they called it gibberish. That's a true story. So uh, it's, there's a nice four volume edition, which I really want to get. I, ha I didn't realize this was available, but I have three different editions. They're all reasonably good. They tend to be better. So looking, I, I want to do the first thing of just looking at the major themes of the Quran, and then we're gonna, I think, uh, end, end soon, huh? Bismillah. When he looks at the, uh, <clears throat> I'll do the summation then. Um, he basically says that if, if you really want to sum up uh, the entire Quran, uh, he says uh, that the ma'ani wal ulum allati tadamanah al Quran, he said, we're going to speak to them in summation and in tafsir. Ammal jumlatu, as for the summation of the Quran, you know, the comprehensive explanation, fa'alam an al maqsud bil Quran. The, the, the real purpose of the Qur'an is So it is an invitation to Allah's creation to enter, to believe in Him, right? To come to Him and to worship Him and then to enter into a transaction with Him. And this is why uh, the human being uh, is, you know, if we, if we define a human being, and, and the, uh, the definition of a human being is not that easy, um, but if we define it, like our students here at Zaytuna study logic, and, and, and one of the ways that you define something in logic, ladies, how do we, what's, how do we get a definition in logic? The genus and the species, right? Well, the genus and the difference, which gives us the species. So the, 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 when, we, when we look at a genus, you're looking at something that, that all the, the things in that group share, right? So for us, it's animality. So the, I mean, this is the way the Greeks defined it, so that we're under the genus of animal, that we're a living being, that we have animality. And, but then what's our difference for, that separates us as a species from all the other animals? Yeah, that we're reason, we, we have reason, we have, we're rational. So we are the rational animal. That's, that's, that's a logical definition of the human being. So for the Greeks, the definition of a human being is, is a, a person, the human being is a rational animal whose supreme dignity is in his intelligence. Like that is the supreme dignity of the human being, is in his intelligence. But for the Jew and for the Muslim, uh, a, a human being is a free individual created by God that has a personal relationship with God and has the ability to enter into a covenant with God and his supreme righteousness is in obeying and submitting to the commandments of God. This is the Jewish definition and, and, and we would concur with that definition. For the Christians, the definition of the human being would be a fallen creature uh, wounded through sin um, and whose supreme dignity is, uh, is in uh, accepting grace, you know, the, 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 the salvific grace of God through a, a sacrifice in their understanding. And, I mean, we would acknowledge that we are wounded uh, in sin. Kulukum khata'un, the Prophet said, wa khayru khata'ina tawabun. All of you are sinful, and, and the best of the sinners are those who repent. So we, we know that we have a black dot, according to the Prophet which is not, I, I, 
you know, we don't believe in original sin in, in the kind of Christian conception of it, but we do recognize that we're fallen as a species, and 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 uh, and f and fallen man has 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 his his struggles. Um, so uh, that is the uh, that is the the summary of the Quran. It's it's da'wat al haq right? Da'wat al khalq ila ibadat al haq wa dukhuri fi dinihi. So it's it's an it's an invitation. Now the Prophet said um, to Al Quran, in Al Qurana Ma'dubatullah. It's the invitation of God to a banquet. That's how in in another riwa it says Ma'daba. So they're both sound and they both Ma'daba is the place where you learn adab. Um, and if if we look at say Naqibra Atas is uh his understanding of our human uh, crises, especially in the Muslim world, he, he says uh, that the human crisis is from a confusion about knowledge, which led to a loss of adab, which led to the rise of false leadership, which uh, leads to more confusion in knowledge, more loss of adab. And so this is the, the cycle that human beings find themselves in. And so adab is a very important concept in our tradition, which in essence is it's a hierarchical by nature. Um, is Islam has a very interesting understanding of the relationship between the egalitarian nature of, the, of, the, of human dignity, that everybody is equal in human dignity, but also recognizing the hierarchical nature uh, of human accomplishment and human positioning. Uh, so it's only through hierarchy that adab really can manifest. So when you, when you lose hierarchy, uh, all of these horrible things arise and part of the the modern uh, condition is trying to eliminate this idea of hierarchy that people that know are above people that don't know whereas the quran clearly states that and then we have deference to people of knowledge uh, and to their expertise so um, you know allah says in the quran ma farratna fil kitab min shay right we didn't we didn't leave anything out of this book and an Orientalist once asked a Syrian scholar, you know, do you really believe that? And he said, absolutely. And he said, well, can, can, can you find out, like, how many loaves of bread in a bag of wheat in the Quran? He said, absolutely. He said, I have that very hard time believing that. So he told one of his students, he said, go get so-and-so. And, and he went and he brought this man and he said, how many bags of, how many um, loaves of bread in a bag of wheat? And he said, well, in the, uh, in, 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 if it's a small bag, I can get 10. If it's, if it's a medium bag, I can get 15. If it's a large bag, I can get 20. And, and then the, the Oriental said to him, I don't understand. He said, this is our local baker. And he said, well, that's not in the Quran. He said, yes, it is. Allah says, فَسَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرٍ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلُمُونَ Ask the people who know if you don't know. And Allah says, فَسَلُوا بِهِ خَبِيرًا Like, ask the experts. So he's the expert, so I asked him. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Any questions? First question. How can non-Arab speakers approach learning the language to understand the Quran, inshallah? And what can we do before learning, mastering Arabic to understand the Quran? They said they're using multiple kind of translations right, right I, now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a, a uh, I'm going to talk about Arabic in one of the later classes. So I'll defer part of the question to it. Uh, one, I would say in some ways, Arabs are disadvantaged in knowing Arabic, modern Arabic, because uh, th there can often be a kind of compounded ignorance. Um, to, to understand the Arabic of the Quran takes many years of, 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 of hard work. I mean, this idea that you can learn the, the language of the Quran in a year is just a, a very dangerous concept in my, in my estimation. The Quran is a profoundly subtle book. Uh, it, um, it lends itself to multiple possibilities, um, and, and it takes a really long time. Now, you can get Obviously, the core messages of the Quran, like if Allah says, Any Arab 
uh, that knows Arabic today would basically understand what that means. I mean, he might not understand that taqwa is, is a very specifically defined type of word, or he might not understand the, the derivation of the word from, you know, waqiya, yaqi, wiqaya, which is prevention, uh, and that taqwa is a masdar, and, um, and uh, those aspects of it. But, but they'll get the general meaning of that. But to really understand where you get into a deep understanding of the Qur'an, it takes a lot of work. And, and it, there's a reason why it's dhalika al-kitab, because dhalika is for ta'zim, you know. And w one of the things that I learned early on, I was in, when I was very young, I was in uh, Mauritania, and, and, and I was um, studying, and, and, uh, and, and I was reading the Qur'an, and, and I had this what I thought was an insight into a thing. And I remember I was gonna tell one of, one of my teachers, you know, I had this insight into the Quran and he just stopped me and said, no, 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 you know, like you're not ready to do that. Don't, you know, he just said, kitabillah. And when they asked uh, Omar what ab was, you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Surah Al-Abasa, you know, ab is a, is a word and, they, and he said, you know, you know, like what earth would hold me up and what, what heaven would cover me if I spoke about the book of Allah without knowledge. So we have to have a, a type of awe uh, for the book of Allah uh, and, and just be very careful. The, 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 what the ajam has direct access to is the ibadah of tidawa. And whether you can understand the Qur'an or not, tilawa has a profound effect on your heart. Uh, and this is just a fact. So if you do, and, and there's something very pleasurable about the Qur'an, uh, about tilawa. It takes some time to get there, like if you look at the body just as an analogy, um, you know, exercise is difficult. But once you actually start doing it, it becomes very pleasurable. So people that exercise on a regular basis, they feel bad on the days they don't exercise. The Qur'an is, is, is like that. If you get into a habit of reciting the Qur'an, and we are what we repeatedly do, as the Greeks uh, emphasized constantly, that habit is very important. كُلُّ شَيْءٍ ibada. Everything is habitual, even, even devotion. And so you have to get into the, the habit and so I would say, you know, in terms of learning the Arabic, it's a really important thing, and I, and I really encourage it to everybody. It's one of the most rewarding things that I've ever done in my life, just having access uh, to uh, this incredible uh, legacy of, of knowledge and over and above all else, having access to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah. But my own experience, and I, and I guarantee you, there are many times when I've read the Quran and I thought I understood it. When I went to the tafsir, there was a completely different uh, meaning than what I was getting from just the Arabic. And so, and somebody asked me, I was in uh, Malaysia last year, and a really, really wonderful uh, Singaporean uh, uh, person there asked me, that they had been troubled about the idea that, that the Qur'an had lacunae. They had taken a course at the university and they said, you know, in the course they pointed out that the Qur'an can only be understood with tafsir. And they couldn't understand how the revelation of God could be, how it couldn't stand on its own, that it would, it would need tafsir. And while the Qur'an definitely does stand on its own as the book of Allah, it does need commentary. And the reason it needs commentary is because Allah has made it absolutely necessary to have a, 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 a transmission. In the Qur'an, Allah says, in laka It is a reminder for you and for your people. Imam Madik said that verse means a man saying, I heard from my father who heard from his grandfather, that this is a transmitted book. And this is why even to this day, when you learn the Quran, you learn it through isnad, if you're learning it properly. So you study with somebody who studied with somebody all the way back to the Prophet And so you have chains 
uh, every Qari has a chain back to the Prophet if they learned it properly. And, um, and so that's, that's uh, part of the nature of our religion is that it's, it's transmitted. Next question. Okay, thank you for that. Next question, this one's from Vimeo and then we'll take one more from Facebook, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. When reciting the Quran, how do you differentiate between quote unquote singing and quote unquote reciting melodiously when, or it, when the former is advised against? Okay, the, it's, that's a good question. The, the Quran traditionally is, is chanted, we would say it's chanted now. What's the difference between that and singing? The, we don't, out of adab to the Quran, we don't talk about like music, like musiqa, out of adab to the Quran. But, but the, uh, the great Quran reciters learned the maqamat, which are musical uh, modes. And, uh, and this is why uh, in Egypt, for instance, the great Quran reciters learned the, 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 what are called the maqamat, which are studied in, 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 in musical conservatories. And this is why some of the great Egyptian singers were actually originally Quran reciters. People don't know that Umm Kulthum, her, her father was one of the great Quran reciters of Egypt, and she learned the Quran early on. She could recite the Quran in all the maqamat, and, and that's where she learned a lot of these things in traditional Arab music. So, but, 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 so we don't sing the Quran in that way. We chant the Quran. And, and the, the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, لَيْسَ مِنَّ مَنْ لَا يَتَغَنَّ بِالْقُرْآنِ uh, He's not from us who doesn't, you know, I mean, some of the, they say that it's, uh, and, and the Prophet ﷺ also said, Zayinu al Quran bi aswatikum, you know, adorn the Quran with your voices. In other words, chant it in a melodious way. And the Prophet ﷺ liked to hear it from certain reciters because they recited so beautifully. In one of them, he said, You've been given uh, like the, the, um, the, the pan flute of Dawood. You know, in other words, he was, his recitation was so melodious and beautiful. Um, so, so the Quran, we should recite it as best we can. Um, but the most important thing, as long as you obey the rules of tajweed and don't, I mean, some people go extend the, the mad more than like a mad al-lazim, which is the, the, the longest mad, you know, uh, farad you know, like, um, the, the, so, so that the the madal lazim that has six haraka. But if you go on and extend it beyond that, then then you you're you're altering the the book of Allah. So you can't do that. So, um, but that I mean that's a whole science of of that 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 the great Quran reciters learn. And, believe it or not, the, the really truly masters of this tradition, they will recite the maqam that's most appropriate for the type of ayah. So we're going to get into the different types of ayah, but they will actually recite for the type of ayah. So if it's, a, if it's an ayah that where there should be, you should feel some grief or sadness, they'll recite in the maqam that engenders sadness in the listener. And if it's, a, if it's something that is happy, if it's something with joy or something, then they'll recite in a maqam, a maqam rust or something that'll actually elevate the spirit. And so that's why great Quran reciters, because of their mastery of this science, they can have an incredible effect on the listeners because they, they, they're, they're using these, uh, these, these, uh, these modes. Is that it? One last one? Because we're going to have to break our fast pretty soon. <laughs> we're here in California on the West Coast. Other people in other places have already broken their fast. May Allah accept it from all of you. Inshallah, pray for Zaytuna. I, I do need to, I really hope people will support the college. I've got the students here, some of the students that got stuck 
uh, here, some of our international students, may Allah protect them. Um, but, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, we founded this college. We're actually in one of the auditoriums in the college. And uh, we, we just, we need your support. I know it's a difficult time, and some people are having a difficult time. May Allah make that easy for you. But I really hope that uh, some of you will find in your heart to support an institution that right now we're just caretakers. We're all passing through. Uh, we're doing this in order that other people won't have to do it. Uh, I would have loved to have come back to the United States and already had institutions built that I could have just gone into. And t I'd much rather be teaching. Now I'm doing a lot of administrative work and fundraising. Um, but I'm doing it so people after me won't have to do it, inshallah. So, uh, we're just caretakers, we're stewards uh, right now, and we'll be gone uh, soon enough, and other people, inshallah, will be here, but um, we, we need your support, so I hope people will find some support. Go ahead, Sidi Harun. Thank you. This one is from Harir, from the East Coast, mashallah. You mentioned about science in the Quran, and we live in a world obsessed with science. How are we supposed to balance the truth of science and its imposition on all other knowledges. Well, okay, uh, you know, I would say, look, science is important, and I, I, I would never in any way uh, denigrate science as such. Uh, however, uh, a lot of science, if you read, I had to read a, a, a book when I was in uh, college um, by uh, Thomas Kuhn about um, paradigms and, and, and uh, he, he shows in that book how science always has these anomalies and, 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 and the, the anomalies often will create problems for scientific theories and then a new theory will emerge. And so it's very difficult to latch on to something like science as an absolute um, because much of science is what in logic we call saving appearances. Uh, for centuries, people were absolutely convinced that the, the sun uh, went uh, around the, uh, the earth, and, and that's certainly how we experience it. Nobody talks about an earth turn. Like, they don't say, oh, what a beautiful earth turn. We still talk about a sunrise and a sunset. So that's the fitra, right? And... and, and but when, when uh, Ptolemy wrote his book, the Christians actually believed that it was an apodictic proof, that, that it was actually a burhan qata'i, that it was an absolute proof for that truth. Well, when Copernicus came along with the heliocentric theory, he kind of undermined that. But even the heliocentric theory has its problems. It's not like these are absolute. It's just, it's the best explanation it's the simplest, using Occam's razor, to explain something. Um, but it doesn't mean the Ptolemaic doesn't, it's, it's not also uh, a valid theory. It is a valid theory, it's just no longer the dominant scientific theory, but people that study the Ptolemaic theory know that, okay, now I understand why people for a thousand years believe that theory, because he does prove his things. He had to create epicycles and all these things to explain retrograde activity and things. I mean, the students here study that at Zaytuna. So uh, how do I view it? I think they're both true. I think experientially we're in a Ptolemaic world, but I think in reality it's a Cop Cop Copernicus um, is right. So this is like Sharia and Haqiqa. I don't have a problem with two. I can grapple with the both. I don't think they're contradictory. They're di they're they're, 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 uh, I mean, they're contradictory at, you know, in, in, their, in their basic assumptions uh, about um, the nature of the sun. Uh, is, it, is it stationary and we're going around it or is it going around us and we're stationary? But experientially, I can understand how one is true, uh, phenomenologically, to use a big word, and how the other is true, uh, 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 in, the, in that it, it, uh, it explains a lot of things also. So I, I just, that's my feeling about putting too many scientific eggs in the Quranic basket I think is very dangerous. Because down the road they realize, oh, that's not true. And then, oh, so what, is the Quran not true? 
So, and, and, you know, if God wanted, I mean, he could have, you know, revealed E equals MC squared, and then a thousand years later, people would say, oh, my God, they got that way before Einstein. And, and actually, there is an argument from a Turkish physicist that the theory of relativity is in the Quran, so I don't know. I, I, I'm not that adept at theoretical physics, so. All right. So, barakallahu fikum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept uh, your prayers. And, um, and inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us any of our sins and transgressions, all of our uh, slips of the tongue. May Allah forgive us. Uh, may Allah forgive us to speak in the book of Allah without the requisite knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, uh, bless our, our uh, physicians and nurses and all the people that are risking their lives for... Um, the well-being of our community and for the greater community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the Muslims, unite our hearts, protect our tongues against backbiting and against all those things that we're uh, particularly sensitive to in Ramadan. May Allah make us sensi sensitive to them throughout the year. May Allah bless and give peace and prayers upon our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we ask Allah to make the Quran Rabi'a qurubina wa jala'a humumina wa umumina inshallah. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين